lifelong learning opportunities for all. In Nasarawa State, North Central Nigeria, billions of Naira have been spent on the education sector in recent past, yet much is still desired at the primary school level. Dilapidated structures, inadequate teachers and poor sanitation facilities are evidently impeding the learning process. Apizanga Primary School is one of the oldest primary schools in Kefi local government area of the state, established in 1948. Pupils of the primary and nursery sections receive lessons sitting on the floor. Some of our classes are dilapidated. They need a renovation. Our children, they were sitting on the ground, no seats. So those are the, some of our problems that we are having. No water, the so-called borehole they did is not functioning. Teachers are key to achieving all of the SDG4 targets, but 16 teachers are left to cater for 1,555 pupils here. There are a lot of challenges in this school, starting by the population of the children with lack of teachers. At the Model Science Primary School, the story is not different. Pupils also sit on the floor, and the ratio is 36 teachers to 2,000 pupils, with some volunteers rendering assistance. And why will you be teaching a pupil, and a pupil will be sitting on the ground, and you want it to be right and correct? When the building was built, they promised bringing the seat. But since we needed to enter, and there's no, the other building is not good, so the parents decide to. <laughs> Just recently, blocks of classrooms under the SDG 2018 intervention in Lafia, Doma, and Kefi were commissioned by Governor Abdullah Yusuley. Also concluded arrangements for the mass construction and rehabilitation of primary and secondary schools in the state under the auspices of the State Universal Basic Education Board, SUBEP. With the adoption of SDGs into the state budget and the highest allocation of 26.3 billion naira to education, science, information and communication technology in the state 2020 budget, residents expect to witness the provision of adequate physical infrastructure, employment of teachers and an inclusive learning environment. Halima Gayam, Channels Television News. Welcome back. So we will take a look at uh, education in Nigeria. Just reviewing that sector, uh, highlight where we are, how far away, where should we be targeting, what should we be doing to get ourselves to the next level if we have to compete in this knowledge economy uh, the world over. We've got uh, here in the studios this morning uh, Peter Okibukola, who is a professor of science and computer education. He's the chairman of Council National Open University of Nigeria and former executive secretary of uh, NUC. Thank you for coming this morning, bro. Uh, pleasure, pleasure to be here. Well, the education sector, I mean, <laughs> sometimes you just wonder, where do you start? You see that he smiled. The, the <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps is, you, you have some <laughs> opening. Yeah. No, but, 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 there's just, yeah. but there's just so much yeah. about this sector, yeah. in spite of what everyone has done, yes. both at the local government, the state, yeah. and the federal level. Yeah. I mean, some say that if the economy fails or yeah. there are challenges, you blame it on the education sector. And some tell you, if things are not going right in society, you look to the ivory tower. So it, it's so huge. But from your perspective, where are we? Well, let, let me begin uh, by drawing from the analogy of uh, the airline industry that you uh, discussed during the introduction. Uh, uh, Mark Bear in Abuja talked about the weather. So I'm going to use the analogy of the weather to say that we have a cloudy environment in the sector, cloudy. A few specks of sunshine. You see, in discussing education, you look at a, a, a number of uh, parameters. You look at access. You look at quality, you look at relevance, mm. you look at equity, you look at efficiency, you look at effectiveness. Now, 
on all of these indicators, our performance, performance of Nigeria is cloudy. Let's take access. Access means those who are eligible to come to school are in school. Access means those who are outside the schooling community that you can offer non-formal education to are not there because the literacy rate of Nigeria, as we speak today, literacy rate defined as yeah. those who can not only English speak, write, I mean, who, I mean, who can uh, speak and write and understand in any language. That's literacy. As the rate is, is paltry. The, I, I, as it's about, as about 67. No, no, no. Oh, now no, no, no. 67? It's about 67%. Because, I mean, and just trust me about data because they have a research okay. group and I, I have, uh, you know, quite some respectable. Uh, but we're not, we're not measurable with Zimbabwe in terms of literacy. Uh, yeah, you, you, you the, see, the you, you, we, we have to put it in context. How many people do you have there? About 200 million Nigerians. So we are among the E9 countries, the countries with the highest literacy rate. So let, let, let me keep going quickly because you asked me for a summary of this. Mm -hmm. We're looking at access. And we have, let, let's come to the schooling community. It's a basic education. Uh, we have quite a large number. There's a figure banded around 11.5 uh, and all of that. Uh, it's come down slightly this year to about 10.1, 10.2. So that's huge. Sorry, which, which figure is that? The, for... Out of school children, those who should be so in school. To 10.1. To 10.1, but 10.16. It came down from where? From, from about 13. Then it was, uh, like I said, a lot of figures have been bandied around. Yeah, because the Minister of Education, yes. while it was undergoing screening in the National Assembly in yes. July, yes. said that the figure of out of school children was yes. about 16 million. And we well, thought, whoa. You, you, know I said, you know what I said just now? Figures have been bandied around. Yeah. The figures that you have uh, from uh, the census, the Minister is right. I mean, the Minister is right because he knows. He has a big picture. But according to the latest statistics that I have, that you find in the uh, ministerial strategy plan, the 2018, 2022, the latest one, it has brought, it, I mean, the, the, the figure has come down. But don't let's bother about the figures. Let's bother about the volume, the number of students, uh, of children who are still out of school. Huge, huge, funding. huge. No, no, I'm, I'm going to come to that. Not, funding is not, you see, people, people just pick one variable. Out of about one and three, I said that is the reason. I'm going to I'm going to adduce quite a few reasons derived from empirical data, not conjectural. Many Nigerians just conjecture about this, about that. I'm going to share, you know, with you and Nigerians, fellow Nigerians, about this. So access will leave basic education. Let's come to higher education. There is uh, an indicator mm -hmm. called. Higher education participation rate. Higher education participation rate is defined as the proportion of persons who are eligible for higher education that are in higher education. In other words, if you have, uh, and that age range is between 16 and 35. So if you have in uh, a society, a community, uh, have a hundred of such people, and 50 are able to get into higher education. Higher education is not only universities, it's not only polytechnics, it's not only college of education, any post-secondary education. All right, so higher education participation rate will be 50. If you have 10 out of 100, higher education participation rate will be 10. The higher education participation rate that is reported for Nigeria and UNESCO circles is about 12%. Although my friend and brother, a professor, uh, the jam registrar, Shaq Uluyidi, will think that is higher than that. Because if you, if, if you took on all the post-secondary, school of midway free, school of agriculture and all that, that bundle all of them together, will not get up to like 18%. So, I, I, I'll just, I'll, let, let me just keep okay. going and I'll just wrap up. So we have another army of those who are eligible for our education that are not there. So yeah. overall, uh, in the access framework, access indicator, 
we have some challenge. Let's go to quality. Quality is what you people see on a daily basis. You see a graduate who is not able to match knowledge and skills with a certificate that he or she is carrying. You say you are a BSc computer science graduate. You'll be alarmed to know that some of them do not know the basics, the rudiments of computing. But you see, I, I'm, I'm, what's responsible for that? I, I, I'll come to that. Why don't you let me give you the, the, the full picture? What I'm seeing, my dear friends, is not the general picture. In any human uh, society, you have every characteristic that is normally distributed. You take it through a normal curve. The normal curve is like bell shape. About the middle, uh, 66, 67%, the average person. The outliers on the left are the very weak ones, on the right are the very smart ones. So I'm looking at the, the middle, middle there. I know that we have quite a number of very sharp graduates coming from our universities, coming from our polytechnics, from our college of education. Indeed, if you went to several countries in the world today, you find that Nigerian, the typical Nigerian graduate is being sought after for postgraduate education. And when they get to the UK, to the US, they are right on top of it. So I, I'm talking about uh, some in that, middle, in that middle band. So quality is depressed. Basic education, higher education, we have quality challenge. Now let's look at relevance. Relevance has to do with what sorry, we are learning in sorry, school. You didn't answer the question of. No, he wants to finish. I want to summary. finish. Just give you the picture. That's it. That. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, relevance has to do with the kind of education you are receiving from a primary school, a secondary school, a university, or polytechnic. Is that education relevant to you, to the world of work? The answer is question. The, the answer is in some part, yes, in a large part, no. I do, I do measure that. You know, I mean, you finish, you have a, a, a BSc uh, in uh, agriculture, and uh, you find that you are not able to apply this as an agriculturist. You can set up a business. You cannot, you cannot implement. We are taught in school all of this, but it's not relevant to, to, yeah. to the world of work. So we have some challenge with relevance. Let's look at equity. Equity means you are allowing those who uh, you know, society else is variegated in terms of gender, in terms of uh, uh, those who are disabled and all of that. You know, you will expect everybody to have an equal chance to access education, to be formal education. I think we're not doing too badly there because if you look at the gender, the gender parity index in our basic education, basic education is almost like 50-50. You look at go all the way to higher education. It's not too bad. Gender parity. Uh, taking care of the disabled ones, we have a lot of challenge there. The latest data that we have, if you look at uh, universities, mm -hmm. you find that those who have some challenge, physical challenge, they are not able to uh, get into the system as well as those. Who, that is why I like to give a lot of credit to Professor Isha Kuluyide, who has set up uh, what, he, what he calls the JAM Equal Opportunity Group that has asked me to chair. What do we do? Uh, we conduct the UTME for blind candidates all over the country. And the blind candidates, if they do well, they are absorbed into the universities. So the universities are now responding you know, positively uh, to that. So on the whole, I've given you a, a general picture of where we are with regard to access, to quality, to relevance, to equity. On efficiency, yeah. we are not also there. Efficiency would mean this. You have uh, two, uh, 200 students enrolled for a, as a cohort for, say, a degree in a university or a diploma in a polytechnic. At the end of, if it's a four-year program, at the end of the four years, you expect the 200 to graduate. So efficiency is output over input as a 100. 
that is 100% efficient. But what do we have? <laughs> you come in, 200 of you will come in. As a result of all manner of calendar disruptions, calendar quaking, you then end up spending five years. So in other words, efficiency is zero at the end of four years. So we have challenge with efficiency. We have challenge with effectiveness. On the whole, it's not is is a cloudy picture. But as I said, we have some uh, a few spots of sunshine, which as we go along, I'll be able to. Okay. But let, let let me just fin uh, uh, finish yeah. by looking at the picture for this year, 2019. I was not expecting that 2019 would be a spectacular year, because it's an election year, mid year, about uh, towards the end of the first first quarter. Everybody is out there electioneering, not paying attention to education. And then after the elections, you then had all, I mean, the, the, the major actors, the commissioners, changing. And so all the new commissioners that are in place now, they will say, oh, we're going to have an education summit, forgetting that the thing is continuous. So we have new actors. So the election year syndrome uh, has not uh, affected education positively. But the good news is that at the federal level, the Minister of Education, Mala Madamu Adamu, has remained consistent. So at the federal level, I think we're moving on the right course. But at the, uh, at the, at the state and local government levels, things are uh, topsy-topsy. All right. So your yeah. question. I, I, back to the issue of quality that yes. you mentioned the other time. Yeah. You, I would love to know why you think that that's the, the quality of education is as comatose as it is. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm happy to modestly say that that's actually my forte. That's my strength. Uh, that's the area where uh, I have uh, some expertise, quality assurance. There are quite a number of variables that uh, interplay in ensuring that quality happens. Uh, the variables are clustered into student-related, teacher-related, curriculum-related, facilities-related, so all of school-related variables. And they are home-related variables. Then you have the process variables and the output variables. Let me just give a few. Let me just uh, expatiate on a few of these. Let's take the student-related variable. The quality of the students getting into the school is important for the quality at the, at the end of it. It's like, uh, let me use the analogy of the tomato puree factory, a tomato puree factory. If you get in good quality tomatoes, chances are very high that you're going to get good quality tomato puree. But if you go harvest rotten tomatoes from, you know, chances are not as high as you get. So if you get poor quality students come into the system, then, except the processing uh, uh, mechanism is heavy enough, that's not going to happen. Well, yeah, isn't so, that, isn't, so, that question, sir? Sorry, sir. Doesn't that question well, the why did you let of, me? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So let me just take this one. Let me just take this particular variable. So if in our universities, you get in all manner of students, scoring very low at UTME and all of that, and uh, the, the chances are not as good that you're going to get good quality graduates. But if, by the time you are taking them in, you cream the top, you get them to be good quality, very smart. And this played out brilliantly in 2002. What happened was that in 2002, we just had a, a, a manner of uh, candidates getting people to do the UTME, UME, we call it at that time, for them. And so you populate the class with mediocres. And so what then do you have? You know, mediocres coming out of there. So we inserted what you call the post-UME at that time, meaning that you go take your, ask some people to go do your, the UME for you, but you go to come and defend your UME scores. What happened that year was that Quite a lot of the high scorers didn't show up to defend, the, to defend because they got. You see, what, what we heard, what triggered it was uh, in one of our cities, I'm not going to mention it. The vice's law came to me as he said, Look, okay, we've got to go 
sort this thing out. Say what? That a large number of <laughs> the students in his university did the UT, uh, UME the previous Saturday. I said, oh, what's wrong with that? I said, yes, what's wrong with that? That these are already uh, uh, students in the university. So how? So I then uh, did a quick arithmetic. Said, oh, they were hired mm. by others to do the UME for them. And so what happened, you get high scores. Mm. And then they will populate the medical class, engineering class, education class, history class with, the, with that lot. So he said, okay, let us insert it. So long story short, we had the post UME. And the, 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 the former minister of uh, uh, power, Professor Nebo, was in office. And, uh, and he, was, he, was, he was VC of uh, UNA. Yeah, uh, and he said, oh my goodness, thank you, yes. That as a result of the post UME, we're now able to get very brilliant students coming to the system that during matriculation, you get all manner of things, people shooting and all that, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And when the students got to, I mean, they, they, they were right on top of it, the students. So if you get good quality students yeah. coming in, the chances are that you will likely get what, good quality What was the reason? Yeah. Yeah. Why were they doing that? Oh, I'm sure you know the reason. Well, uh, you're talking about somebody doing the UME. Yeah, well, when the oh, professor yeah, you, comes you know and that. tells you, it happens. The students here came to do oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You see, there were a lot of sharp practices going on, and it's all part of the larger societal malfeasance. I mean, where you get somebody to do the uh, SSC for you, and that is what uh, possibly is chasing everybody. No, but this one you suggested, correct oh, yes. me if I'm wrong, it sounded yes. like it was institutional. No, no, no. Not, not, it was just coincidental. Oh, okay. That is, uh, in any city, it happens. You go talk to your brother who is. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a, the 300 level in the university, come and do the UME for me. And they do the UME. So it, 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 it was general. Well, were VCs similar. involved at that time? No, not involved. They, they won't be involved. I mean, they just got to hear of, uh, of the phenomenon happening. And they had to raise the alarm, and uh, we, we took action. Yeah. About so, your analogy. Yeah. So the, 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 the quality of students coming in, yeah. the quality of teachers. Okay. On the quality of teachers. Yes. Because now when you say if, if you have poor quality students yes. going into class, yeah. it will affect the outcome. Absolutely. Now I get your point on that. But then, what happens to the quality of teaching? Yeah. Because you would have thought that if you have very good quality teaching, yeah. uh, for want of words, no matter how or if the quality of students is not that good, <laughs> yeah. they will have an impact yeah. on the quality of students. Yeah. How do we connect the dots? A lot. You see, as I mentioned, several variables are implicated. I just mentioned one out of 128 variables. Wait, wait a minute. For the student, there are several variables there. One is your reading culture. One is your attitude to schoolwork. One is your level of intelligence and several others. For the teachers, one is their experience, uh, the qualification, motivation, attitude to work. Then you have the facilities. The school is another, uh, it's another variable. And uh, uh, you, you, for the home, you have home support. You have uh, for government, you have all manner. See, there are one, only about 138 variables. So you are holding other variables constant by saying, OK, now you have a student who is not so good, mm -hmm. coming into the university. Now, if it comes into a university, not only the teaching, you see, the, the, the facilities that are available for delivering the curriculum, that's another, another, another fact. But then let's assume that I want to teach a computer science student who is weak. I'm, I'm desirous of giving him or her the best. Now, I'm desirous, I come to the lab, nothing is there. How do I deliver that? I come to the district, my, uh, the, the, the school is on strike. How do I deliver that? So one can say that's a federal government variable? Uh, which one? This, the infrastructure. Uh, not, not federal government. Uh, okay, let me see. Education. People just, you know, people are not clearing their minds about, or rather refuse to, uh, to, to recall that education is on the concurrent list. Education, local government, 
education no, 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 I'm states. I'm talking about the you, you talked about the tertiary. You have state-owned universities, mm -hmm. state-owned, and I tell you what, the state-owned universities are the poorest of the pack. And I keep telling in, them. In every respect? I never respect. Poorest of the pack. Wow. You see, we have the federal system, we have the state system, we have the private system, subsystem, if you like. The, the, the state governments are just a pain lip service to their universities. Why is that? Oh, yeah. Why well, well, should I should ask them? Bring one of the governors here and ask them. No, See, but from I, I your experience. Tell you that, from my experience, that they are not able to put their money where their mouth is. They will set up the university and they will expect that university, that little baby, to crawl and walk and run the same day. Poorly funded. I mean, they are so poorly subvented that you, it's just a pain. You just tell the vice chancellor, look, my friend, I'm able to give you. you see, Meantime, the federal government, that, that's why I'm taking it off the federal government. Mm. The federal government is doing its best to you know, uh, uh, put some money in the uh, federal university. Not enough, mm. but better. I'm talking about relativity now uh, with the others. The uh, state governments, federal government will pay all the, maybe like 95% of the salaries of their workers. State government, state governor will say, Vice Chancellor, I'm going to give you 30% of the cost or, or the wage bill of your workers. Go and look for the rest. Where does this man or woman, vice chancellor, look for the rest? Where? How does he put up buildings? How does he or she uh, 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 get money to run the university? Our state universities, our state governors, I'm just appealing to them. They are not doing justice. It, we have 48 of them, 48 of these universities. There are a number of things. that yes. I, I would love, for instance, you've yeah. talked about three tiers of education, and sure. we have just you know, really spaded the conversation. Yeah, but, but we'll, we'll come back to that component uh, yeah. about funding, but yes. I hope it won't take us too far away from <laughs> the other issues we need to raise oh, because yes, of the good. time. Because, yes, yes. oh dear, it's already time for <laughs> us to go in. To, to, uh, but when we come back from this break, we'll highlight more on some of those issues you've talked about. Join us again. Kano State in the northwestern part of the country is one of the most populous states with the reputation of being the commercial nerve center of northern Nigeria. However, the huge population comes with a disadvantage as the state is home to thousands of out-of-school children known locally as al -Majari. At this retreat organized by the Kano State Directorate of Council Affairs, the newly appointed commissioners, permanent secretaries, and other heads of government agencies are taken through the rudiments of governance towards effective and efficient service delivery in the state. Chief among the focus of the retreat is how to reposition the education sector, especially addressing the challenges of out of school children and the Almajaris syndrome. According to the state's head of service, Kano alone accounts for over 40% of the 10 million out of school children in northern Nigeria. Government is making preparations as soon as the reports are available. We make preparations to see how we can engage them in school. In fact, government is looking at its 2019 intervention, UBEC intervention, uh, with a view to building classrooms depending on the number of out of school children in the allocations. So we allocate classrooms to depending on the number of out of school children per, I mean, if you look at the local government, Anyone that has more out of school children will be given more classrooms so that we can have more of them going into school. The state governor stresses the importance of human capital development in the realization of the next level agenda of his administration, especially through education and youth empowerment. We have been emphasizing this issue of human development, of which two factors are very important. One, that of education, and two, that is the provision of health services to our people. In fact, one of the major indicators of the difference between developed and developing countries are these two key areas, apart from the economic development of the countries. In Kano State, we have taken these two issues very, very serious. Concerning the education sector, we've already made a pronouncement that education in Kano, for now, is free, 
compulsory from basic to secondary education. Kano State Government has declared free and compulsory primary and secondary education to curb the manners of out-of-school children and the literacy. But it expects all stakeholders to join hands and lay a solid foundation for the sustainability of the project. Welcome back. Well, Prof, you talked about uh, funding and state universities, how they seem to be very poor on almost all indices because the state governors will not fund them appropriately. But then, uh, I came across this where he says, talked about uh, a report published, uh, I think, Senate and Business News, it says the, there's a decline in international student enrollments in the U.S. since the fall of 2016, and it's costing them $11.8 billion dollars and more than 65,000 jobs. Now, you may say that's for the U.S., uh, bring it back home to Africa. Yes. In Ghana, for instance, they have about 75,000 students. That's according to what I'm reading here, in Ghanaian universities. Now, I know the former minister of uh, sports, uh, they've talked about different figures, how Nigerians spend, some say, 300 billion naira annually in that country's universities. So if the quality is good here, isn't this an option for us to have foreign students. They used to come here in the past, foreign students. How do we lose all of those? Why are they not doing anything about it to ensure that we keep attracting those foreign students as a source of revenue because countries, the university the world overdo it? Yeah, I have good news for you, uh, uh, Mr. Russell. Good news for you. Okay. Good news for Nigerians. Uh, and that is that the current executive secretary of the National Universities Commission, Professor Abubakar Damorashe, has developed not that he, he has led the development of a blueprint for the rapid revitalization of the Nigeria University system. I'm going to give you some snippets of that that will reverse the entire thing. Uh, that blueprint has started running 2019 to 2023, and it's going to cost 823 billion naira to implement. Babar Rashid, as we call him, is now seeking for funds to do all of that. And the funds are, are coming in. And what reverses are we looking at? We are looking at, okay, you see, the push factor for those going to Ghana and elsewhere is that we do not have enough spaces for them. One. Two, is that our calendar is not stable. I mean, if you have a child who wants to read history, uh, of media studies for four years. And you notice that ah, this particular context or this particular environment, instead of four years, we spend six years. Oh, where can we get a place where this man is going to spend four years? Send the person there. I'm telling you with all the data that I have. But there are private that universities. The quality of, yeah, yeah, there are private universities, mm -hmm. but we will appear that uh, uh, the, these universities uh, are not, are not uh, how do you call it now, in terms of pricing, are not attractive to so many of the Nigerians and other people that price it. You see? But in the, terms of quality, some of them are right up there. Oh, oh, most of them are right up there. In fact, in terms of quality, you cannot, you hardly can beat the Nigerian University system in our region, in Africa. You see, I, I, if, if, I, I will know, because I only recently conducted a regional survey of quality of higher education, that AU EU project. I went through, I went around almost all the countries in Africa, and we looked at the quality of the Nigerian professor. Pick a Nigerian professor, regardless of what anybody says. Yeah. It's only when you have not seen the other fa a person's farm, uh, the other person's farm, that I say your father's farm is the best <laughs> or the worst. For me, I've seen other farms, and I know that the Nigerian professor is solid. Go anywhere. Hmm. Now, you know, so to, to round up on this one, okay. there's a plan running that will reverse all of this. It's called the Rapid Revelation Plan of the Nigerian University System. So in a little while, maybe another four or five years, we start seeing a graduate. It's not going to, it's not going to be a top, uh, zero one thing. Hmm. It's going to take a little while. Okay. To, yeah, to, we'll still to talk about the curriculum, but yeah. when you highlighted 
the challenges that state universities face yes. because the governors will not do what they need to do or put yeah. their money where their mouth is. Yeah. Let's get across to Professor Yahoo Zabello. You may know him. Yes. He's the vice chancellor of Bayero University, a, a great Kano. Man. Great man. So he joins us from Kano, uh, our studios in Kano. Good morning, Prof, and thank you for joining us this morning. So, uh, uh, good morning, and thank our, you. Okay, so speak directly to that matter. Uh, how is your university faring in, in terms of uh, at least funding, ensuring that infrastructure is in place and you meet with the targets that you set initially? How is BUK faring in that regard? Well, uh, with all modesty, I would say that uh, compared with other universities, we are doing quite okay. Uh, we have been using our resources effectively and uh, a point that has been made by Professor Okebukola is the fact that uh, some proprietors are not funding the universities the way they should be funding them. Uh, if not for TED Fund, many state universities would be closed. Uh, but TED Fund is supposed to be an intervention agency. The proprietor, the state government that set up the university is supposed to fund them. Uh, TED Fund is only to assist, but it is, it is other way around now. Uh, in Bayer University, we have been able to harness resources from various sources, uh, from TED Fund, from, from the proprietor, the federal government, and uh, from other sources. And uh, I believe we are doing quite reasonably well in that regard. Uh, uh, Professor Bill, uh, could you expand this conversation a little bit to other tiers of education, primary education, secondary education as well, in uh, especially maybe in Kano and maybe other areas, because we are trying to review what your perspective ha uh, would be about education in Nigeria in the year that is expiring uh, tomorrow. What's your assessment? Primary, secondary? Well, I, 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 I believe the common denominator in the Nigerian education system, the main common problem is the issue of lack of planning. At all levels of the system, Planning is missing. Uh, when you have the uh, basic, uh, the, the universal basic education, U UPE, no proper planning was made uh, to provide uh, adequate facilities, the, uh, huma the human uh, resources that are required. It is the same thing at the university level. That uh, state governments are busy setting up universities left, right, and center. Private universities are coming up, but nobody has thought beforehand of training, the, uh, uh, providing the staff members, training the staff members that uh, would man those, uh, these universities, providing the resources that would be used for these universities. This has led to, uh, I mean, inadequate number of pers uh, personnel. You have lecturers visiting three, four universities, the same lecturer teaching in three, four universities because the uh, new universities have been set up without, uh, I mean, plans for wh who, would, who was going to man them. It is a same thing at the at primary, secondary school level, especially in public schools where you have, uh, in many states, you have classroom meant for uh, 35 students, uh, hosting as many as 200 students in that classroom. Again, this is because there is no proper planning the, uh, about how many students would be needed, uh, how many uh, teachers you need to uh, teach the students, how many classrooms you need. Uh, uh, this affecting the quality of the students that come from the primary school to secondary schools, those that come from secondary school to universities, uh, and so on. So this is a common denominator. Well, Prof, uh, another... speaking about uh, TED Fund, uh, there was a report that was published in, in February, uh, and it said that, February 2018, uh, pardon me, it, it said there was this three billion naira TED Fund for research that was not accessed by universities, and it was shocking the reason why. Well, NUC at the time said that, uh, that was their director for research, innovation, and information technology. He says the reason is because when I read this, I, was, I didn't know what to say myself, because it says funds could not be accessed because many academics do not know how to write research proposals that could secure them grants. I had to read it verbatim. How can this be? 
Well, um, I believe it is historical reason. You know, uh, money in Nigeria it was started uh, with government funding, that uh, money for research and other things were provided by government. Uh, government stopped doing that, and we have not uh, adopted the culture of getting research funds from outside. There have been a number of uh, isolated cases of uh, success in that regard, but I'm happy to inform you that the story is changing. Uh, TED Fund in 2019 advertised for staff member, uh, professors to apply for research grants. The response was very great, and quite a number of uh, research groups have secured funding from TED Fund. Uh, I don't know the quantum of fund that uh, TED Fund is uh, approving, but I know in many universities, in Bahrain University, we have uh, 13 research groups that are getting an average of 30 million naira per group. The number is low, certainly, but this is the beginning. I believe that uh, in the next few years, the money uh, made available at TED Fund will not be enough uh, for the number of research proposals that will be submitted. So the story is changing positively, and that is a very good development. I need to bring in Professor Kobe Kala into this as well, because, I mean, when you speak about quality, yeah. quality of the tomatoes <laughs> to get a good tomato puree. Yes. Now, quality yes. of the maker of the tomato puree. <laughs> yes, 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 because yes. if they can't write these proposals, yes, yes, yes. this is a damning uh, report about some of these things. Yeah. Even though he says it's improving, but why should it even be in the first place? Yeah, it, it, it should be, because it's an art. Grant writing is an art, which you develop as an academic over time, during your training days. As an undergraduate, you hardly, I, I don't think you wrote proposals to, for a grant. But when you get into postgraduate education, you begin to be schooled in the art of proposal writing. Even the best of the professors may not have the top-notch skills for proposal writing. So you've got to go for training in writing grant winning proposals. And that is what is on now. That is what the Vice Chancellor of Bayou University, a great man, is saying. So efforts are on. In 2002, as a Executive Secretary of the National Investors Commission, I set up a training program because I knew that there was that gap. So it's not, it's not absurd. It's that you have to keep building your capacity. It's a lifelong learning thing. So we set up research grant training program for our professors, and that's still going on. Okay. So but many more people are getting into the fold of those who are now trained to write grant-winning proposals. Doesn't that then, yes. among other things, yeah. beg the question of entry level? Because this tomato puree maker oh, yes. you know, starts from this oh, primary, yes. primary education to yes. secondary education yeah. to you know, tertiary and all of that. Entry level of these trainers, of the teachers from primary school, teachers into secondary school, teachers into university. Uh, re only recently, the NUEC reported that there were fake professors, just as the Kaduna State Governor was uh, said to have yes. given tests yes. to teachers, I think as a primary or secondary school teachers, and many of them failed. And the same thing happened in, in, in Edo State, some not, not, of course not, not this year, and a number of you know, things like that. So how do we begin to check the, pro the entry level of these puree makers. Wonderful question. You see, uh, the, you see, I was describing a, a model based on our empirical work about the variables that contribute to the quality. The teacher factor contributes the most. When you aggregate them in the clusters, the teacher factor. If you get the teacher factor right, the chances are very high that you will get the entire quality in the system right. So our teachers are superlatively poorly prepared. Poorly prepared at you know, most of the levels. You walk into a math class in a secondary school. What do you find? You find that the math teacher knows less than the JS pupils that he or she is teaching. I get alarmed when I watch biology teachers and I see them, they are drawing, they are whatever, completely poor. So what has happened is that our teachers are deficient in several, you see there are three knowledge bases for a teacher, either in a university or in a secondary school or primary school, three knowledge bases, three, three places that they hang their feet. One is the content knowledge. That is the knowledge of the subject, knowledge of your physics, of your mathematics, of your 
mathematics like uh, Professor uh, Bello there, uh, or, or whatever, content knowledge. So the other is pedagogic knowledge, knowledge of how to teach, how to ask the, the right questions, how to manage the class. The third is a merger of the two, pedagogic content knowledge, how to teach your chemistry, how to teach your geography, and all of that. So on the three knowledge bases, uh, teachers are weak. So efforts should be made to bolster, if you like, to in all our teacher preparation institutions. And I have good news for, for you. The good news is that the World Bank has intervened by the setting up of centers of excellence for teacher preparation. In different parts of the country? In different parts of, of Africa, West Africa, for instance. For Nigeria, Lagos State University won the Africa Center of Excellence for producing STEM teachers, teachers, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So we are reformatting the entire system. Indeed, we won that bid because of a homegrown, homegrown technique that we are now using to prepare our teachers. Okay. It's called the cultural, I'll, I'll just mention it quickly. Okay. It's called the cultural techno contextual approach. It's novel and we're applying it. And by the time we produce our first, our series of teachers, they will, they, they, they will rev uh, reverse all that we're talking about Okay, here. let me take this to uh, Professor Bello now. Uh, you, you heard uh, Professor Kebukola say this. How do we, I, I'm concerned about the entry level of the teachers into the system. Well, he's talked about what is being done to revamp the system, especially for those who are already there. How do we ma ma manage the entry level of the teachers into the, the, the educational system in the first place? How come we have these poor teachers in the first place? How do we make sure that we don't have these poor teachers coming into the system at all in the first place? Well, well I believe it is a manifestation of one key problem of our system, the overemphasis on paper qualification, not on uh, uh, competence. Uh, uh, the teachers you mentioned in Kaduna State, in uh, Edo State, on paper, they are highly qualified. They may have NCE, uh, they may have grade A, A, A in the subject they teach, but uh, the, their competence is uh, the key uh, uh, question. And uh, the preparation stage, uh, the college education where they attended, uh, perhaps you, uh, so many of them were in class. How effective were the teaching uh, to them? Uh, then, of course, there is the issue of corruption, that uh, some of them may not have, have even come from the college education. They may be holding a paper that says they have this qualification, but they, they may not have ever attended a college education. So uh, we need to uh, correct uh, this. We have to improve uh, the uh, teaching uh, environment. We have to ensure that we emphasize competence over paper qualification, not only in teacher preparation, but on, in all aspects of our educational system. Professor Bello, uh, earlier Professor Kim Kula talked about the, the lack of continuity um, especially at uh, you know, uh, state levels where the commissioners of education change from time to time. But then you also spoke about planning the other time. So uh, the planning, when, when you talk about planning in this regard, what are you talking about really? Because if there was, because some would agree that if there was a plan indeed, they, the plan would continue irrespective of the, whoever is heading the administration. So when you talk about planning for education, what are you talking about? Yes, uh, that aspect of continuity is part of it. Uh, if there is planning, as you rightly say, whatever policy you have on ground would be owned by the state, by the community. So irrespective of who is in charge, it will continue. Uh, but the, in, in specific terms, I'm talking about when you are trying to do something new, you should look at the implications, what is required, what it will uh, lead to. Uh, we have been doing that in Nigeria without consideration uh, to future uh, uh, plans. Uh, UPE and UBE were two concepts that were introduced. One, nobody uh, thought of how many teachers would be required for these programs, how many classrooms would be required, and more importantly, what happens after graduation? If you increase the number of students in primary schools, you know that in six years' time, these students will graduate to secondary school. What arrangement have you made for them to continue their secondary school education. Then six years later, these same students would qualify for tertiary education. 
what arrangements have you made to absorb them into tertiary schools? I mean, all these things were missing, and these are some of the ingredients that led to the failure of uh, the programs. Uh, it is the same thing, uh, it, as I mentioned earlier, at the university level, that uh, from a few universities, you want to have so many. But what arrangements have you made? Um, if you compare us with uh, other countries, even third world countries like Malaysia, like Nigeria, Malaysia liberalized their uh, university education by allowing the introduction of private uh, universities, is, uh, establishment of more public universities. But before they did that, they, they sent their uh, people on training. Uh, for many years, in U.S., in U.K., the largest number of uh, foreign students you have doing master's PhD were from Malaysia. Uh, over a, a number of years, they uh, produced so many people with PhD that there are too many for the university they had. Then it became very easy for them to introduce additional universities because they have the people that would man those universities. In Nigeria, it is the other around. You keep opening universities without a, a plan for who is going to man those universities. This is just an example about the university level. It is the same thing with uh, other levels. This is why I said, if you go to many states, if you go to primary school, uh, public primary schools, public uh, uh, secondary schools, you'll find 100, 200 students uh, in a class that is meant for 30, 35. Because we are not planning ahead for the action we take today. Okay, Professor Bello, let me bring this same issue to uh, Professor Okebukola. Uh, how do you react to this? Yeah, I'd I, I like to um, disagree a little bit with what uh, Professor Bello has said, that we do not plan. Uh, if you are looking for a country with plans in education, in the power sector, everywhere, everywhere, it is Nigeria. We have all the plans. Every, we have the plans. No plans. No, 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 no. that's a different thing. No, that's, that, 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 that's the catch. No, no, no. What is the that's problem? The catch. No, 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 no. That's the, no, no. You know what he said is that we do not have plans. Maybe because we can't no, see the I'm results. No, exactly. But let me tell you what. There is no university in Nigeria today. 171 of them that hasn't got, including his university, that hasn't got what we call a strategic plan for the next five years. 2020 is uh, next tomorrow. Look, several years back, Baba Basanjo, we look at vision 2020. Is that already a plan? We have plans. No, no, for heaven's <laughs> sake, we have plans. Okay. The only challenge that we have, and I'll tell you, the only challenge that we have is not being able to follow so through deviate our plans. From the plan. No, 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 to follow okay. through our plans. So we have plans. And, 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 and I, need I need to bring this uh, in before we wind that. down so yes. that both of you can respond to it. Yeah. Relevance of the curriculum. Sure. And this is very important. So tell us about this. Why uh, is it that, because times sick. change so quick and fast uh, yes. these days, yes. the curriculum that you go to see in some schools, you ask yourself, which country <laughs> are they teaching students for? Yes, is this for this same country? Yeah. Why? Do we seem to be teaching as though those subjects are not for this country? Forever and a day we've had that challenge. Just like you said, when the curriculum is announced today that this is the basic education curriculum for uh, uh, integrated science, it's almost like outdated today. And what we do is to load the curriculum with content that the following year will be outdated. So I've been following a path of unrighteousness in terms of curriculum development. You see, uh, the correct part to tread is to teach our students how to learn, to present them. Who's responsible for changing it? Yeah, the, 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 the curriculum government? development, no, the, the ministry. Yeah, no, no not, not the, the federal government, because the, the federal government is responsible for standard setting, and this curriculum is part of those standards. So you have the uh, NARDC for the basic education one, and you have NUC for the universities one, FBT for the polytechnics and NCC. Okay. So let me tell you what has happened. Oh. What is happening now? No, it's urgent. I, I need to bring you, Prof, because we need <laughs> yeah, yeah. to go. Okay, we yeah, yeah. 60 no, it's, seconds. It, yeah, 60 seconds. Okay, that's fine. The curriculum of the Nigerian University system is now being completed. By next year, you're going to have one that follows the kind of model that you're thinking about. Okay, so Prof, uh, could you tell us what is going on with your curriculum? Can you change it? to make it tailored to what is relevant in the country, in your
the BUK? Yes, uh, I agree with uh, Peter uh, on the issue of uh, urban plans. In theory, each university is supposed to be revising its curriculum every five years, but that may not be happening. But I would also want to clear one issue. Sometimes people complain about curriculum that uh, we do not produce uh, students that will work into the industry. No university in the world produces a student that will just, uh, from today, from graduation, will go and fit into uh, each and every industry. But the fact that our students, our graduates from Nigerian universities, can fit very favorably with graduates from all over the world. And the graduate of Nigerian University was 2-2, would go to UK, US, and uh, get master's PhD with flying colors. So it didn't, I mean, the complaint about the curriculum may be overblown, uh, that uh, certainly uh, we need to update our curriculum. We need to uh, uh, go with uh, current trends and so on. But it's not as bad as people think about uh, of it. All right, then, Professor Yahoo Zabello, Vice Chancellor of Bayer University, Kano, as well as uh, Professor Peter Okay, Bukola, uh, of, uh, he's the chairman of Council for the National Open University of Nigeria and former executive secretary of Nigeria Universities Commission. Thank you for coming on this morning. Thank you very sir. much. Sir. Thank you, Prof. Uh, so there you go. Uh, some part of education, even though they normally lecture for two hours. <laughs> 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 we only by the hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we'll, we'll back in a moment. Stay with us.